Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Well, God is good. And all the time, God is good. Good morning, everyone, and God's blessings to you today. It is good to be with you. Hey, I have to say, we, I've got some comments to make about the fruitfulness that the Lord has in mind for PCF. But looking at the entire apron of the altar filled with our kids makes me feel like we've been fruitful. <laughs> this is a fruitful congregation. Uh, in all honesty, I give thanks to God that all those kids are gathered here and that those kids are getting great instruction in the things of the Lord, in the word of the Lord, from the people of the Lord. And I'm grateful for our teachers. I am grateful for Pastor Rochelle Cortez, who leads our children's ministry. And uh, I know we've got teachers here uh, in the congregation as well uh, that are not teaching this service, but teach at other times. Yes, yes, we give thanks to God for that. Uh, the, the most tragic thought to me, or at least one of them, would be to think that all those kids would be gathered here today, but five, ten years from now might not be in a church. And you know that's a statistical reality for a lot of congregations. Yes. Let's let, not let that be the reality for these kids. Amen. I don't mean that we keep people somewhere that they don't desire to be, but I mean that we cultivate in them Amen. a heart for the Lord. Amen. They're here now and they're hearing now and I know that you agree with this, but it just, I, I feel my heart touched by it this morning. Let's really put our prayers into those kids Amen. and let's give our time unto those kids and the families because we want to see those young people grow up for the Lord and in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, today we are continuing and in fact concluding our series on the Fall Feasts of Israel. But I want to say a couple of things, just, uh, just personal stuff. First of all, you can see I've got my brog on. I'm ready to go to the Philippines. Right. I'm already preparing for the heat. Actually, it's cooling down here, right? But I know it's going to be hot there. So we do indeed thank you for your prayers for us, Sister Hazel and I, as we uh, prepare to travel to the Philippines Tuesday. And I, I also want to th say thank you so much for the generosity with which so many of you have sown into this trip and made it possible for us to go with your financial gifts, also with your prayers. Uh, all of which are absolutely precious to us. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, do indeed uh, continue to pray for us. Uh, of course, we're leaving Tuesday night. We will be back two weeks from tomorrow, actually. We'll be back on the 22nd that evening. I want to let you know that in my absence, there's some wonderful preaching that's going to be coming out of this pulpit in the next two weeks. Next week, a week from today, Pastor Emmanuel Madeja, Pastor Leo from uh, Praise Christian Fellowship San Fernando will be back with us. Some of you have heard him preach before. He's a wonderful man. He's a wonderful student of the word and he's wonderfully filled with the spirit. And he's going to be bringing a message on how to read the signs of the times and uh, looking up for the return of the Lord. A very timely message and I know you'll get a lot out of it. In two weeks, I'm pleased to say that our own Pastor Chris Callen will be here in the pulpit. Uh, yes, another uh, spirit-filled um, speaker and great student of the word and great uh, disciple and disciple maker. And he will be preaching about how to get on fire for the Lord. And that's a timely message as well. And he's a guy who knows how to do it. Get on fire. <laughs> there you go, see? He's got the spark, right? Amen. The spark of the spirit. So two great messages that are going to be coming up over two great weeks. I uh, want to encourage you to continue to be part of the fellowship during that time. And of course, we will look forward to sharing all about our, our trip with you when we get back. I'll be preaching at uh, a variety of churches, speaking at the Western Visayas District Conference, and also uh, making connection with our PCF pastoral uh, partners in, uh, in Tondo and elsewhere. So lots of great stuff. Well, we come to the word of the Lord today, and as we do so, let's pray. Uh, we want to not only read the word, but receive the word and believe the word and let the word be a seed implanted in us and the spirit bring forth fruitfulness from us. And so prayer is our partnership in that. The Lord who speaks and the Lord who sends is the one who will do, but our prayer helps get us ready. So let's pray. Father God, we do indeed thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. 
in the midst of whatever trials or struggles we may be having, in the midst of whatever joys or frustrations, whatever concerns or aspirations, we calm ourselves right now and settling all of those things at the foot of your cross and at the base of your throne, we say, Lord, speak. Your servant is listening. We want to hear from you. We want to do more than just hear. We want to receive, believe, apply, and extend your kingdom by your grace to your glory in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The fall feasts of Israel, we've spent the last uh, three or four weeks looking at it. Days of awe. Days when we remind ourselves of the presence of God and the person of God. His holiness, his purity, his perfection, the reality of his judgment, the availability of his grace. And in those days, we recognize our own need, that within us, as Paul said, dwells no good thing, that we are fallen people, all we like sheep have gone astray. But God offers to us atonement the opportunity to be at one with God. That though we have been separated by sin, God by his grace brings us back in. And in that oneness, we have joy. And in that ingathering, we give thanks. So these are days of thanksgiving, but also of getting ready, anticipation. Because what God has done before, God continues to do and will do again. The one who was and is and is to come is Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, as Hebrews 13, 8 says. And so in the fall feasts, we see a picture not only of who God is, but also of how Christ is to come again. As we come to today's study of these days of awe, atonement, and anticipation, we are going to talk about an element of one of the feasts, the feast that we looked at last week. There were three festal days that we've looked at in this series. Let's review them together on this uh, day of summary, if you will. We started by looking at the Feast of Trumpets. It begins the year. It's the head of the year, as they say in Hebrew, Rosh Hashanah, which is another way of saying a new year. It's a new agricultural season. That's where it fits in the calendar. And it's time for a new hope from the Lord in that moment. Because with the harvest comes also the promise. The promise of a renewing cycle. A new year, but also a time to think upon the old year. About the ways in which in the past we've gone astray or gone wrong. In the light of God's holiness to recognize the heaviness of our own sin. But also in that, the day of atonement, that day of fasting... That day of repentance is a day of forgiveness, a new heart from God. God says, I will replace your heart of stone, that fallen nature, which is hard and harsh and judgmental and in the worst kind of way, that is carnal, motivated by the fleshly appetites rather than the spiritual sensibility. God says, I'll remove that from you. And in its place, I'll give you a fresh heart of flesh. That is a sensitive heart, a spirit-filled heart. Next year, we're going to spend some time talking in a series about a man that God called one after his own heart. David, King David, a man after God's own heart. David had a heart that was warmed by the spirit. And I think that's the kind of heart that God is talking about for us. So the Day of Atonement is also a day where there's a new heart from the Lord, a new sensitivity. And with that sensitivity comes joy and fruitfulness. The Feast of Tabernacles, as we talked about last week, was the Feast of Ingathering, truly a Thanksgiving feast when all of the harvest was collected and the people of the Lord gave thanks to Him for what He had provided. And we also mentioned how that feast was something that both looked backward to the home that God gave to Israel, his children, as he brought them out of the slavery of Egypt, out of that land of the edict of death, and through the wilderness into a new place, a promised place, a new home for them, a land 
flowing with milk and honey, which is another way of saying a land of fruitfulness. Where every creature is fruitful, that's the milk. And where the land itself and everything that grows in it is fruitful, that's the honey. So a land of milk and honey is a land where everything is being fully fruitful in what it was made to be and what it was made to do. And so for us, as human beings, you see, we were made to have a new heart from God, to receive his new hope and to have a new home with him, a home in which he lives with us. Even as God dwelt in the tabernacle in the wilderness with the children of Israel, so also God says, look forward to the new age to come when there's a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem, and the dwelling place of God will be with human beings, with his own people, a new home for eternity. What a blessing. What a promise. So they built those shelters, you remember, out of the limbs and branches of trees, out of the very fruitful things that God provided was their dwelling place. In the fruitfulness which God provides, in the faithfulness which God fulfills, there is a new home for us. And in that new home, there's a new flow of life that produces a new health. And when I say health, I don't just mean strong and robust and fruitful, although that's certainly true, but health in the maybe the most Hebraic sense of the word, the most godly sense of the word, wholeness. Will you say to someone next to you, health means wholeness. If somebody's broken, they're not well, right? But when somebody is whole, that is complete and put together, that's the new kind of health that we're talking about. In the Feast of Tabernacles, there was a water ceremony which was repeated in those seven days. You'll remember that the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, which comes as the very conclusion of the major feasts of Israel's year, and which teaches us to look forward to the new creation, the new age to come, the fulfillment of all things. That Feast of Tabernacles took place actually over eight days, seven days in which the feast was actively being observed and then an eighth day of rest in which it was culminated. And throughout that, there was a water ceremony that was performed as a part of the observance of the Feast of Tabernacles. And in John chapter 7, that ceremony becomes the center point of one of Jesus' most uh, exciting statements that he has made to those who will believe in him. So, as I mentioned, across the course of these seven days, there were various offerings being made as a part of the observation of the Feast of Tabernacles. And one of the offerings was a, a, a water offering or a liquid offering, a libation offering is what it's called sometimes. You may remember some weeks ago when we were in the series talking about the miracles of Jesus, that there was a pool outside of the the uh, city limits of Jerusalem at that time, a cistern that was made to collect water. You remember we talked about a healing that Jesus did there uh, with the blind man? That cistern that collected the rainwater was also a, a, a water source for the city. And during the Feast of Tabernacles, the priests would go out to that pool and bring water from it into the temple that was immediately nearby. And they would pour that water from the altar and down the steps of the temple. And in fact, this was something that happened over the course of each day. And then on the last day, there was a particularly large water offering that was made and the ceremony was particularly elaborate. And part of the reason why they were doing this is that they were recognizing that this feast, which was about how God had grown uh, pro provision and protection for his people, how God had provided fruitfulness in the harvest, that all of that started with the rain. In other words, the rain that comes down from heaven is a sign of God's faithfulness and God's provision. And so they would take that water, which was so precious to the harvest, and they would bring it to the Lord, as if to say, Lord, you who provided the rains that provided the harvest, we offer back to you this precious water to recognize that you're even more precious than it because it comes from you and it symbolizes who you are, that you are always fresh, that you are always flowing, that you are pure and that you provide. So it was a thanksgiving act. In the midst of doing that, Jesus stood up boldly and said, as they were pouring that water, if you're thirsty, 
Come to me. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. This is a verse that I've mentioned and preached on throughout this year repeatedly. And no doubt most everyone in the room knows why. John 7, 38 is really the theme verse for our year. It's the verse from the Bible that the Lord called out to me when he said, 2018 will be a year of living water for Praise Christian Fellowship and for Los Angeles. It'll be a year of living water for you. And he called my attention to this verse. In fact, on December 31st of last year, I brought a message that Sunday morning on this passage. I almost hesitated to make this the focus of my preaching again this morning because I felt I was at risk of just repeating myself. Then I reminded, reminded myself, or was reminded probably by the Lord, that it's really not me that chooses what I'm going to preach on, but I'm following the prompting of the Lord. And I know that the Lord has even deeper meaning in this verse for us yet to see. Part of what I hope today's message will accomplish in all of us is to take the opportunity after 10 months of having focused on living water in so many different ways to focus on where we're at now, what it means for us now, and where we go next from here because this passage has a, 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 a direction that the Holy Spirit wants to lead us in, I believe. New health, not only for PCF together, and yes and amen to that, but for each one within the sound of my voice. The Lord is saying today, I want you to be whole. I want you to be well. I want you to be washed and cleansed amen. by the flow of living water. So three questions that we can ask ourselves today. First, am I going? Am I going to go where God has called me to go? Am I going to go in the direction in which God is flowing? Am I going to believe what God has said? God has said, I am pouring out living water at PCF in order to prepare for fruitfulness. Amen. Collective fruitfulness, fruitfulness in our city, fruitfulness in our faith, but also individual fruitfulness in your own lives, in your own homes, in your own careers, in your own families, your own bodies. People who have illness or sickness, and the Lord says, I am flowing into you a new health that brings a new hope Amen. for a fresh harvest of fruitfulness. Am I going to believe that? There are challenges to it. The enemy will come and say, you've heard that and heard that and heard that, but is it really true? And what we will have to answer is, am I going to believe him or am I going to believe him? Him. Amen. Am I going to act on it? Am I going to step out on that water as Peter did? Step out in faith to stand where there seems to be no place to stand. Believing that, as the song said, thank you, Don Moen, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. Am I going to allow God to do what he wants to do in me, even if I don't understand it. We spent a long time at the beginning of this year in a series that said, God speaks, but are we listening? Am I going to listen? Am I going to thirst? M notice that when Jesus makes the statement, whoever believes in me, rivers of living water will flow forth from you. He begins by saying, whoever thirsts, come to me. Am I going to come to Jesus? And something for us to remember is when Jesus says, rivers of living water will flow from your innermost being. In the Greek, that term for innermost being refers to an anatomical environment. It's an anatomical word in the Greek. And what it refers to is a space inside the body that is open, an open, empty space. You would use it for a stomach. Cause, well, especially about this time of day, right? <laughs> I shouldn't call your attention to it, but your stomach may be a little bit empty right now. It's a space within you. It's the same word that is used for a womb. The space inside of a woman in which life is prepared to grow. And it needs that space in order to grow. It's the same terminology that is used for the inside of an organ like a blood vessel. 
where there's a flow of life that moves through that space. What is the point? The point is, Jesus is saying, if you have space for me, I will flow through it. If you have hunger, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, Jesus said, because you'll be satisfied. But if you and I are full of the things of the world, well then, we are full of the wrong things. If we are constantly soaking in the ways of the world, constantly drinking in the words of the world, the wine of the world, and there's a lot of whining in the wine of the world. If we are filling ourselves with that, we risk not being thirsty for God. If we are feeding only on our Twitter feed, and some good, there's some good Twitter feeds, but if we're just feeding on what the world puts out, we are unlikely to be hungry for feasting on the word of God. But when we will empty ourselves of those influences and really hunger for the word of God and feast on it and really thirst for the spirit of God and receive him, then Jesus says, there in that emptiness, I will flow life from the very inside of you Amen. and it'll be my life. Am I going to let God do that? Yes, we are going to let God do that. Now maybe... That yes is as resounding for you as it is for me. Maybe that question is utterly settled in your life, but you and I can still ask this question. Am I flowing? Yes, I believe God. Yes, I'm going to do what God asks me to do. Yes, I trust that God will make the way. But why is it then that I don't seem to operate in the strength of the Spirit? Why is there any kind of dryness or limitation on the activity of the Spirit in my life? Am I flowing? Well, let me suggest this, that this is not a question that is posed in order to make you and I feel guilty. Rather, this is a question that is posed to, to build in us that expectation. Do you want more of the Holy Spirit active in you? Thirst for Him. The will of God is that you would have Him. That's the promise of God, the promise of the Father. So I think if we are not experiencing all the fullness of the Holy Spirit in our life, it isn't because God doesn't want us to. It may be because we're not as hungry for him as we could be. It may be that we're not as focused as in, on him as we should be. It may be simply that we just don't believe we're worthy of that. Or that we don't believe that he thinks we're worthy of it. But remember, the worthiness he is looking for is not ours. It is instead the blood of his son. And as long as you and I are washed in the blood of Jesus, we will be filled with the spirit of Jesus. In a few minutes from now, the blood of Jesus comes to us in a cup meant to go into our innermost being, but also to flow out of us in the activity of the Holy Spirit. God wants you and I to flow in the Spirit because God wants you and I to grow in the kingdom. It is the Father's will that you and I should bear much fruit. Jesus says so. The Word of God says so. That means that you and I can bank on it. In fact, we should invest in that. Jesus said that if I abide in you and you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But in me, all things are possible for the ones who believe. Amen. You and I are meant to grow, and we are meant to ask ourselves, is that growth showing? Am I actually growing? How would I know? Well, for one thing, the flow of the Spirit will be leading me, and the gifts of the Spirit will be proceeding forth from me. There will be prophetic confidence and prophetic utterance from my life. My prayer will have focus and power because of the focus and power of the Lord. God will grant unto me miraculous faith and grant unto me and you prayers that bring forth miracles and healing. These are the works of the Holy Spirit. These are the works that God has prepared for you and I to do according to Ephesians 2.10. He will surely bring it to pass. Not only that, but the fruit of the Spirit will be developed in us. Love and joy and peace and patience will be the characteristics of our life. We'll be able to see that, and we'll know that it's not our own righteousness that's on display, but the righteousness of Christ at work in us. But other people will be able to see it too. 
They will see the self-control. They will see that there is a spirit of Jesus Christ manifesting the quality and character of Jesus Christ in us. Now, don't get condemned in thinking, well, not at every moment do I reflect everything of Jesus all the time. Understood, all of us fall short. But what we can say is God is moving us from glory to glory. The day by day we are being transformed increasingly conformed to the likeness of Christ. And over time, more and more of that fruit of the Spirit will be produced in our lives and in our congregation and in our city and in our world. Amen? Amen. This is the promise, part and parcel, of not only the Feast of Tabernacles, but Jesus' declaration on that day. The completion of the harvest is a completion of fruitfulness. We look forward to the fact that he who began a good work in us will see it unto completion. This statement from Jesus came on the last day, on the eighth day, on the day that looks forward to the new age. And he was saying, in this is this promise, that the spirit will be within you. Jesus said, believe in me as the scripture has said. What does the scripture say about him? So many places, far too many for me to list all here. But again and again, the scripture says that there is a Messiah, there is a leader, there is a savior come from God. Deuteronomy 18, 15, the Lord will raise a prophet from your brothers. In other words, among human beings, God will raise this one up, the greatest and best. And the Lord says, listen to him, do what he says, obey him. Isaiah 28, 16, the Lord will lay down a cornerstone, believe in him, and you won't be displaced. Many things are going to be shaken, and many people not only will be shaken off of where they stand, but even shaken apart. But if you and I, if we will found ourselves on Christ, the cornerstone, then no matter what else shakes, you and I will stand firm standing firm on him, the rock that is higher than I. Habakkuk 2.4 says, the righteous shall live by faith. Faith in what? Faith in whom? Faith in God and in the one whom God sent, which is Jesus Christ. The scripture also says that there is living water for those who so believe. Isaiah 41, 17 to 18 says, rivers, streams, and pools God will send to the parched, to the needy. You hear that? To the thirsty. To the ones who are looking for him, to him for provision, he will send it. Isaiah 28, 16. He will send waters in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, and drink to his people. I want to call your attention again to this blessed table to which we come in a few moments and remind you that not only do we come to the table, but even more importantly, the table comes to us because it's the Lord's table. He's the one who lays it out, and he's the one who laid himself out on it, body and blood, given for us, a drink to his people, and he is himself the one who pours himself out, emptying himself into us so that we could be filled by his life. Even as Joel said, the prophet, Joel 2, 28, the Holy Spirit will be poured out on all God's people. Isaiah 44, 2 through th uh, 3, says that you and I do not need to be afraid if we trust in the Lord. Thus says the Lord, who made you and formed you from the womb, from that place, that empty place where he made life grow from that inner place where you and I were knit together in our mother's wombs, fearfully and wonderfully made, the very one who made us, that creator, he says, don't fear, O Jacob, my servant. And you, you know what that means. We've studied the life of Jacob. You know that what God is saying there is, don't be afraid, you fallen, failing human being, because I made you for a purpose, and I'll fulfill that purpose. I call you upright, because I chose you, I made you mine, and I will pour water on the thirsty one. I'll pour streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit, not just on you, but on your offspring, my blessing on your descendants. PCF, hear this, brothers and sisters, everyone who trusts in the Lord, this passage has a promise in it. Not only will I pour out my goodness and my spirit on you, but I will pour it out on your fruitfulness the very fruitfulness that I bring forth through you. Jesus commands 
and equips us in this basic statement, this powerful promise to go with God's flow and also to flow with God's go, to recognize and receive that what God is saying is, I will dwell within you, I will flow forth from you, and I will make you fruitful. And he who is promised is faithful. He also will do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I ask if those who are serving from the table would bring it forward now, because here is God's flow. This table is God's flow, and it's flowing from his very veins, flowing even from his heart. The Gospel of John describes Jesus on the cross, his side pierced, and out of his side, blood and water flow mingled down. It was a biological event. It refers most likely to a condition known as hypovolemic shock. When somebody has lost an extraordinary amount of blood, as Jesus had at that point, through the uh, excruciating trauma of his scourging, his whipping, through having been pierced quite literally on the cross. He had lost so much volume of blood and plasma that his body was in extraordinary shock. And in that condition, around the heart, the pericardial sac begins to fill up with fluid, obstructing the proper functioning of the heart, so that when he was pierced, all of that blood and fluid, that blood and water came out. But the Lord knew that what was happening there was not just an anatomical event, not just a biological event, but a powerful spiritual sign of this truth that in God's blood is living water, that in Christ's death, our life resides and flows. All sin washed away. New life made possible. In fact, promised. And so... This body and blood is going to come to you. I, I'm sorry, I'm multiplying you. I thought there was somebody on the other I'm side. Big <laughs> <laughs> but I'll be back. We ask that all would uh, hold their portion until all have been served. We're going to worship as the serving occurs. But I also ask and invite you to pray. Let the Lord speak to you about what he wants to birth in you, what new harvest he wants to bring forth through you, because God intends for you to flow with the go that he is speaking over your life. Let's worship the Lord.
Take your portion of the bread and hold it before you. The Feast of Tabernacles happened after the harvest was finished. But you and I today are partaking of a covenant in which the harvest isn't yet done. Not everyone and everything has been brought in. And because of that, sometimes it may be hard for you and I to hold on to hope. But right here in front of you is bread. And only God could do this. Bread before the harvest. Usually you've got to cut down the grain and grind it up before you can have the bread. But that's because the one seed that makes this bread, he did fall to the ground. He did go down into the tomb and rose again so that you and I today could partake of the bread of heaven. As you eat of this body of Christ, broken for you and for me, for our forgiveness, eat of the hope of the harvest that is to come and be fed by the faith of God which is in it. Lord, we thank you for your body and as your body we partake. taking the cup before you. This is the cup of the new covenant in Christ's own blood. I said that Christ is calling us to go with God's flow and to flow with his go. And by that I mean that he is saying, let me live in you and I will give you the direction and the energy to do that which you have been made to do. But sometimes what we really need is to let go. So if that's where you're at today, and no matter where you're at today, whatever you're holding on to, of sin, of sorrow, of regret, let go and let God's blood bring new health to you. Drink to your health because it's his health to you. Health for your body. If you've got a physical need, as you drink this, drink it believing God meets that need. If you have an emotional need, if you need health in your bank account, in your marriage, in your family, in your spirit, then let this cup of the new covenant bring health to you wherever you need it in the name of Jesus who gives it. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. The name of this Lord's table, communion, is also the Eucharist. It's an old-fashioned word that comes from the Greek, and it means thanksgiving. We give thanks to God who gave himself to us. And we being many are one body in Christ. We have all partaken of that one body, and I want to remind you, we are one body, and we support one another in prayer, and we encourage one another in faith. So as we come to this conclusion of our uh, service this morning, I want to invite any who are asking for prayer for travel or are celebrating a birthday or an anniversary to come forward. My wife and I are going to stand here because we ask for your prayer over us as we travel. I also want to raise for you a prayer request, speaking of new health. Please pray for Sister Feli Torres. She's in the ICU this morning, and I'm not exactly sure what uh, the issue is that has brought her there, but many of you know that she's been struggling with not feeling well and she's been undergoing testing. So please lift her and Brother Renee up right now and ask for God's health and strength to be great.